So uh, welcome to the Grow On webinar series. This series um, is uh, designed to um, give growers the latest technical information, both on production and pest management in any kind of covered crop. Um, we mostly talk about uh, floriculture and greenhouse vegetables, uh, but luckily today we get to talk about cannabis as well. And several of us in the greenhouse team at OMAFA are actually on the cannabis file, including Kara and myself. Um, so if you want to learn more about the webinar series and um, make sure you don't miss a webinar, the best thing to do is probably to um, uh, follow uh, one of our blogs, so the On Floriculture blog or the On Greenhouse Vegetable blog, so you can see those here, or follow one of us on LinkedIn. Um, so for our cannabis webinar today, our, one of our hosts is gonna be Sebastian Jacob, and he's a professor at Niagara College. Um, he's in charge, there he is, uh, of both the horticulture and cannabis production programs. So he's gonna give you um, just a talk quickly about those programs and then introduce our speaker for today. All right, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are at in the country right now. Um, uh, Sarah already introduced me, so I'm Sebastian Jacob. I used to work in the industry and in the greenhouse industry for IBM uh, with growers before. And since a few years, I decided to convert myself into being a professor like Zamir as well, and I'm teaching the next future generation of growers instead. Um, but you're not here for learning about me today. You're uh, here for Zamir and his talk. So um, let me just introduce him quickly. Um, I'm honored uh, to welcome the endowed chair of Simon Fraser University, uh, Dr. Zamir Punja. Um, Dr. Punja started his impressive career uh, back in 73, which is uh, a mere two years uh, prior to Dr. Theodore uh, Diner, uh, that first named and discovered a video with, uh, if you knew that or not. Uh, he said they passed away uh, just last month, so we can uh, maybe respectfully uh, raise our hat to him on, on this aspect. Uh, but if we focus on Dr. Punja's uh, career, um, he is worthy of many uh, different uh, awards. Uh, I will not name them today here because we don't have enough time for this. Uh, but just to name a few, the Outstanding Research Award from the Canadian Phytophytology Society, uh, as well as a lot of teaching and science uh, teaching award from Simon Fraser University. Uh, his contribution to the academic uh, uh, research is quite outstanding with the mo uh, over 400 papers and books and book chapters and uh, a lot of grad students. Um, he graduated from his PhD and postdoc uh, studies uh, at UC Davis around uh, 1981. And uh, right on, he went to lead the biotechnology group uh, with the Kendall uh, Institute of Research. And he joined Simon Fraser University at the associate professor position in 89. Um, what I found the most remarkable of Dr. Punja personally is his dedication to having work and still work today in, uh, with so many industry groups, organizations, boards, associations, and so on, on many devastating pathogen threats. Um, his expertise goes from pathology, ecology, epidemiology, tissue culture, biotechnology, including genetic engineering. And he literally paved the way to uh, many uh, management solutions for the industries, uh, from carrots to ginseng to blueberries uh, to cucumbers, uh, with a lot of outbreak of diseases that uh, pop up during those years. Um, he also is, um, it's, it's an obvious reason to me why he's also the uh, recipient of the NSERC Synergy Industry uh, Collaboration Awards as well. Um, in the cannabis industry on our side, uh, we also have benefited a lot from his work since the legalization. Um, the first new of its kind CPS um, uh, literature uh, paperwork in the uh, uh, Cannabis Journal of Plant Pathology is uh, attesting to that. Uh, his recent work on viruses also the veil uh, for the top today, uh, and is uh, willing to be uh, here today to present to our class and to the Go On webinar is also uh, attesting to his uh, dedication to the industry in general. So with no further ado, uh, please let, uh, let me uh, welcome you, Zamir. Um, Zamir will present us today his latest discovery on the viroid, uh, uplatent viroid in cannabis, with a talk entitled Understanding and Managing the Uplatent Viroid in Cannabis. So Zamir, thank you very much for accepting my invitation, and the floor is yours. Yeah, and we'll get Dr. Uh, Punja to share his slides. And in the meantime, while he's getting that set up, I just want to go over a few housekeeping things. Um, so if we could get you to put your questions 
in the Q&A function that you'll see at your uh, menu on Zoom. Um, you can also use the chat, but we prefer you reserve that for any technical difficulties or just general comments you want to make. In the Q&A, you can also um, look at quest other people's questions that they've put in and um, upvote them. And so this is going to be an hour long um, webinar with another half an hour for questions at the end. So make sure you get your questions in there because this is sort of a unique opportunity to ask a lot of questions of a really important expert. So with that, I will turn it over to Samir. Great. Thanks very much, um, Sarah. And thank you, Sebastian, for that introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. It's uh, 420, April the 20th. We should actually be out there celebrating. Um, maybe we'll get to do that later, but unfortunately, we're, we're um, locked into this, this webinar because um, there's an extremely important topic that we need to discuss that I think uh, is affecting the cannabis industry in Canada and also in, in the US. And obviously, that's um, hop latent viroids. So I'm going to share with you information that's already in the literature. Um, as well as information that uh, we've developed in our lab to give you sort of an update on where things are. And uh, just before I get started, just acknowledge there were a number of uh, organizations involved in this collaboration, uh, Pearson Farms, uh, ANL Labs uh, in Ontario, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and uh, Three Rivers Biotech Labs, and, and as well, of course, uh, Simon Fraser University. And here are some of the co-authors that um, helped me put this, this work together. So for those of you that don't know, just a quick overview on viroids. Uh, they're, they're different from viruses in the sense that they don't have a coat protein uh, surrounding the RNA molecule. And despite that, as you'll see, they're extremely stable. Uh, they, can, they can withstand uh, some pretty resilient environmental conditions. They are the smallest plant pathogens that we know of. Um, I, I've put a number here, 50 nanometers, which is actually five one hundredths of a micron which makes them so small that even uh, in, the, in an electron microscope, they're hard to see. Um, they're, they're tiny, tiny, tiny particles. And yet, in addition to cannabis and, and hop, they do affect a number of other plant species. And I've listed a few diseases here, uh, potato spindle tube of viroid, uh, chrysanthemum, citrus, peach, uh, coconuts. There, there are a number of different diseases that are caused by, by viroids, not a whole lot in terms of numbers, probably uh, between 30 and 40 but they do extol uh, pretty severe damage on the um, plants that they, that they infect. So just a quick uh, overview on their, their taxonomy and characterization. The hop latent viroid is, is in the same family as the potato spindle tuber viroid. And so we use a lot of the data that's being published on that viroid uh, since the 1970s to understand a little bit more about what we're dealing with. And as I mentioned, this is a, a, an RNA molecule that is uh, not encapsidated, which means it doesn't have a, a surrounding protein coat. And it's very small. It's only 256 nucleotides. And uh, you'll see the significance of that in, in the next couple of slides. It's, it's really uh, not a lot of genetic material that's present uh, in, this, in this organism um, that it doesn't even allow it to code for a single gene on its own. And yet it causes this tremendous damage and we'll see why that is. It's also unique in that it replicates in the nucleus of the plant. Uh, a lot of the uh, microbes such as viruses will, will replicate in the cytoplasm. This one replicates in the nucleus. And down here on the bottom, you'll actually see the, the structure that the RNA takes is more or less a rod shaped. And that's what gives it the tremendous stability that, that um, we see with this, with this microbe. Now here's a, a computer generated image of what this RNA structure looks like. And this is, this is the strand here of the RNA, which is 256 nucleotides. But when it's formed in its most stable structure, it's a, it's a double stranded molecule, as you see down here, this is a rod shaped. And if you were to look at that um, very closely, what you see, of course, are these nucleotides, these RNA um, individual units that are, are formed in the double stranded structure that gives this the viroid the stability. So this is what it would look like uh, in its double, double stranded form. And this is what creates a lot of the, um, the stability in this organism. Now, when you look at um, viroids such as potato spindle tuber viroid, and this is a study that was done a few years ago where 
they actually purified the viroid and um, put it on a glass slide. And that's what you see up here at the top. These little squiggly worm-like structures are actually the individual viroids. And then they subjected this to various treatments uh, to try to break this viroid down to sort of denature it. And as you can see, as you go from A to B to C, um, they had some success. You can now, if you look at C, you can actually see the double-stranded nature, right? This, this really tight rod has come apart and it's now forming this, this spherical object, which is still the, the viroid molecule. It's still intact. Uh, and this was done at 75 degrees centigrade. So at 75 degrees centigrade, some of these viroids have broken down, but at the same time, you can still see it's retained its double-stranded um, structure in this, in this image. So this is under very, very high magnification. And down here on the bottom, you'll see a, a statistic that's really scary. 10,000 viroid particles in a single plant cell. 10,000 viroids in a single plant cell. So you visualize that we have millions of plant cells. You multiply that by 10,000, and you can imagine the, the load, the amount of viroid that could be present in, in, in a single uh, infected plant. Uh, it, there's, it's, the numbers are just mind boggling. Now, if you look at it in comparison to the RNA of a, of a virus, let's say a virus that infects bacteria, which is a T7, the long strand that you see here is the RNA of the, of the um, virus. By comparison, hop latent viroid is this tiny little squiggly uh, structure up here that looks like a, a little gummy worm. Uh, it's, it's so small that again, when you look at it on a scale, this is 0.5 microns going across. Again, this is five one hundredths of a micron. It's that small. And yet this tiny structure uh, here is able to cause so much problems or so many disease symptoms on plants such as cannabis. And we still don't fully understand how these symptoms develop. We'll, we'll probably talk about that a little bit at the end, but it's still unknown how these viroid molecules interact with the plant to cause um, this disease. So what do we know about hop latent? We know obviously that it originated from hops. Uh, it now affects cannabis and hemp. Uh, we've just recently done some experiments in the lab and we can demonstrate that this viroid will replicate in other plants such as tobacco and tomato. Now I throw this out there simply from an experimental perspective, not to uh, cause concern amongst tomato growers or tobacco growers that this is going to be a disease on those plants. It simply states that it's possible for this viroid to replicate under experimental conditions in other plants such as tobacco and tomato, which actually might lead us to more research efforts where we don't have to deal with cannabis plants. We can potentially look at uh, tobacco or tomato. And in fact, most viroids do have a very wide host range. So for example, potato spindle tuber viroid affects over a hundred species, which again includes potato, tomato, tobacco, and petunia, and many other plant species. So it's not unexpected that hop latent viroid would have additional hosts that we don't really know what they are as yet. Now on hops, although it's called latent, latent the word latent means uh, no symptoms or, or hidden. Yet in hops, we know from research, research data that there is a significant reduction in yield of the flowers or the cones. There's a reduction in, in bitter acids. There's a reduction in, in various types of terpenes, essential oils, et cetera, et cetera. So when this viroid is replicating in hops, it does indeed cause some kind of damage. And when we talk about replication in cannabis, you'll see very similar features where things like the essential oils and terpenes and cannabinoids in cannabis are also reduced as a result of infection by this viroid. So there's some uh, evidence from hops that um, there is indeed a negative effect on quality of the, of the hops, which obviously will affect what goes into the beer. A little bit of uh, history. Uh, this viroid was first detected in California. I think most of you know that. Um, it's believed to be probably around since about 2011, when they think it may have been transmitted from a hop yard that was close to a cannabis farm. And uh, at least that's how we think uh, it was transmitted, most likely mechanically, because this viroid uh, does move quite easily mechanically. Um, in Canada, we first have a report of it in 2020. 
from ANL Labs, and this it happened to be in British Columbia. And since then, it's it spread pretty extensively. And I'll show you some numbers that that indicate that in Canada, uh, as well as in the US, it has been spreading for at least a number of years. So here's a summary of data uh, collected by ANL Labs uh, in Ontario, where samples submitted by growers, a total of almost 16,000 samples from nine different provinces were tested over three years. And from this, they found approximately 4,100 samples were positive, which means the infection frequency is about 25% uh, in Canada, which means one out of four plants or one out of four samples submitted was positive for hop latent. It's likely that the numbers are higher because this is only samples submitted by growers. They may have been other samples that were not submitted. And as you see on the bottom, these were leaf samples. And the reason I bring this up is because uh, in a few minutes, you'll see that leaves are not necessarily the best place to sample. Uh, in fact, the roots are actually better. And so the data here are based on leaves, but I suspect had we sampled roots early on, uh, the numbers would probably be closer to 50% in terms of infection. So one out of two plants being grown somewhere in Canada most likely has hop latent. Now here's some numbers. I don't want to spend too much time on this other than to tell you that back in 2020, uh, an outbreak in British Columbia resulted in about 22,000 uh, samples being submitted with an infection frequency of 92%. So we were the leaders back uh, in 2020 in terms of how many plants were infected by hop latent. But as you work your way across to 21 and 22, you'll see the numbers have gone down uh, close to 15%. And that's because growers were basically destroying plants that were infected, which is really a very, very good, uh, very good thing to do. In 2021, Ontario submitted about 6,800 samples of which 14% were positive. And so when you look at the overall averages in terms of over three years, we're looking at about 15% province across different provinces that have hop latent. And just about every province except Manitoba, uh, no samples came in from Manitoba that were positive, but basically Alberta, British Columbia, Nova Scotia, Ontario, PEI, Quebec, all have incidents to some extent of um, hop latent. So it is pretty much widespread throughout, uh, throughout Canada. What does it do? So the early reports from California showed that plants were infected by this viroid. They were stunted, uh, poor development of flowers, uh, reduced flower numbers, a symptom that they refer to as dudding, uh, reduced number of trichomes on these flowers, and a pro rooting of clones. Now, I should point out that the symptoms that you see or will see will definitely depend on the stage of growth of the, of the cannabis whether it's a, it's a flowering plant, whether it's a mother, whether it's a clone, um, it'll, it'll vary a lot uh, in terms of symptomology, as well as when infection occurred. The earlier the infection, the most likely you'll see symptoms. If the infections occur later during growth, you may or may not see uh, symptoms. And so when we look at the slides that I'll show you on symptomology, bear in mind that um, there are going to be differences in terms of the the strain, the cannabis strain, whether it's in vegetative growth or flowering, and uh, whether the infection was early versus late. That all has an impact on when symptoms will actually develop. Now, if we start with the mother plants, uh, or certainly the vegetative plants that are going to become mothers, there are some few symptoms. Um, I may have looked at a thousand plants and I can show you symptoms on only three or four. So it's not like uh, these symptoms I'm showing you are very prevalent, but if you do see curling uh, of the leaves, uh, inward curling, um, stunting growth, you may suspect that you have hop latent. Now it could be something else, but certainly those plants should be tested. Anything that shows symptoms should be tested. But for the most part, uh, these mother plants tend to be asymptomatic. In other words, they look okay. Uh, they seem to be growing okay, but as you'll see later on, they'll yield uh, clones or cuttings that are probably infected with hop latent. Now here's a very dramatic example of what hop latent can do on a susceptible or a sensitive cannabis strain. Um, 
I show this slide and many growers will look at that and say, oh, I've never seen that before. That means I don't have hop latent. That's not true. This happens to be a case where we can show clear stunting, shorter internodes, uh, the, what we call the classic symptoms of, of hop latent. But it doesn't mean that other cannabis strains that are infected will necessarily show the symptom. You will see this. And this is a classic symptom that was described in California. And we see it here on some strains, but not on all cannabis strains. Another symptom that some of you may have seen is what we call lateral branching. This is a situation where instead of the, the shoots growing straight upward or outward, they actually start growing sideways. And you can sort of see that happening here on this particular, uh, in this particular photo. And as you progress in these plants, you'll see that when the plants go into flower, these branches, rather than being upright, they actually start um, falling, falling down, literally. And if you push down on these stems with your thumb, these things break apart really easily. So it's a very brittle uh, structure that um, is fairly easy to see when you've seen a, a picture such as this. So we were curious to know why is it that um, this plant is growing sideways and why is it so easy to break? And so we ran a couple of um, scanning um, slides or microscope slides. And what you see on the left is what you would expect in a healthy plant. The arrow shows you the outside cortical tissue. And underneath, of course, is the xylem. On the right here, which is a disease plant, you notice the cortical tissue is way, way enlarged. And the xylem tissue down below is, is much less. And so what that suggests to me, with the xylem being the structure that supports the plant and, and gives it strength, by building up more of this cortical tissue, you're actually making these stems weaker. And that's the reason why they're probably bending and breaking, is they don't have sufficient um, development of the xylem. That's at least the, the idea that we're working on right now as to why these plants look the way they do. So we've looked at this under computer enhanced imaging. This is a normal stem on your left, a hop latent infected stem on the right. The arrow is pointing to the enlarged uh, cortical tissue as you see here in green. The, the center part, which is the blue is the xylem. And you can see the xylem width is much less here in the infected as opposed to in, in the healthy. So um, don't ask me to explain why, I don't know why, but it seems like the development of the xylem tissue is reduced in these plants that have um, hop latent. And that could have some implications for transport or it could have some implications for um, susceptibility to disease. And so on that note, um, we came across one particular strain that's shown here, where when we cut open the, the plant, so on the, on the left is the uh, healthy hop latent free. And in the middle here is infected with hop latent. And we looked at that and I looked at that and I go, well, you know, that to me looks like fusarium. This is a, a classic symptom that we described years ago um, caused by fusarium. And in fact, when you isolate from this, these plants, you do get cultures of fusarium. But what I thought was interesting was that the fusarium was only showing up where we had a hop latent positive plant and we didn't see the fusarium in the hop latent negative. So we followed that up with some experiments where we artificially inoculated plants that had hop latent with fusarium, which is on your left, and uh, plants that were healthy, not infected with hop latent with fusarium. You see a little bit of development of fusarium, but notice the big difference between a plant that has hop latent and one that doesn't. What that's telling me is that these plants may be more sensitive to infection by fusarium, either as a result of their slower xylem growth or because of something else we may be seeing a, a higher uptake of fusarium because hop latent has already infected these plants. And so we did the study where we compared um, six different strains of cannabis. And we had um, sets of plants that were either infected with hop latent or were healthy. The infected ones are shown here in red. The healthy are shown in blue. We then took these plants and inoculated them with fusarium. And lo and behold, what we found, and the arrows show this, is that where we had hop latent infected plants, the development of fusarium was much, much greater, particularly in some of these um, strains that are shown here by, by the arrow. 
This was not observed in every cannabis strain. So you notice down here with Blue Dream, with this particular strain here and this strain over here, there was no difference. So certain strains, when they're infected with hop latent, may come down with more fusarium than one would expect. And again, we don't know the reason behind this, but it's, a, it's an interesting observation. And it suggests that hop latent may be causing more damage than we think because it's being more susceptible to other pathogens. Okay, so um, those of you that root, obviously from infected mother plants, you will have noticed that when you take cuttings from a mother plant that's infected with hop latent, your frequency of rooting is less. So here are our two clones. On your left is infected with hop latent. On the right is a healthy. And when you follow these along, you'll see on the left infected, on the right healthy. Notice the rooting incidence proliferation is much reduced. And this was reported earlier on in California as well. These plants don't, these cuttings don't do as well. They're not as vigorous. They don't produce as many roots. And if you take this down further to, to flowering plants, what you see, of course, on your left, much fewer roots coming through the rock hole in the infected versus the healthy on your right, where there's way more roots, root systems developing, suggesting the plants are way more vigorous. Now, this could be one of the reasons why they're more sensitive to fusarium as well. You've got poorly developed root systems. Maybe the fungus gets in here easier than over here on the right. But certainly the root system is affected. And if you take this all the way through to the end, uh, the flowering plants, you notice healthy plants on the left, infected on the right. In both cases, the root system is way reduced. And so when you've got a poor root system, it's obviously going to be a plant that maybe doesn't yield well, doesn't grow well, and maybe is more susceptible to disease. So that's something else to be aware of, is that you've got a compromised um, root system as a result of a uh, hop latent infection. So this just summarizes that when you've got poor roots, you're going to get poor cuttings that don't grow as well. The plants will have less vigor and the redu reduced root development may increase susceptibility to um, pathogens such as, such as fusarium. So, there are these other secondary effects of hop latent that we need to be aware of. Now let's move on and talk about flowering plants. Flowering plants is where we see the most obvious symptoms. And when you look at a plant that's two weeks in flower on your left is infected on the right, it's healthy. You notice the, um, the leaves are smaller. The flower buds are going to be smaller. Overall, it's a slightly stunted plant. Having said that, if you remove the healthy plant from this photo and just look at the infected one, you may not notice or may not realize that it has hop latent. It's only when you have a comparison such as this side by side that you can tell that that plant on the left is compromised and has hop latent. Here again, on your left, infected plant, the, the flowers are indeed smaller. The leaves are smaller. The plant is stunted on the right. It's, an, it's a healthy plant. But again, if you were to remove the healthy plant, you may look at this small plant and maybe, oh, it's a fertilizer. Maybe it needs a little bit more nitrogen. Maybe there's something going on. But actually, it's hop latent that's caused the stunting and the uh, small development of these, these flowers. And so that's one way that you can look for hop latent visually is make comparisons between plants. And wherever you see stunting or small flowers, there's an indication that you could have um, hop latent. Here again, very, very easy to see that the plant on the left is infected with hop latent when you compare it to a healthy plant on the right. Shorter internodes, the leaves are slightly dark green, and uh, as you'll see later, the flower development is, is compromised. When you go all the way into full flower, these are plants that are almost ready to harvest. The plant on the left is healthy, the one on the right has hop latent. And again, when you make the comparison, you do see the stunting, the poor flower development. But if that plant was sitting there on its own, you may have looked at that and go, well, it's not doing as well. Um, something may have happened in the nutrition or in the lighting, but actually it's the stunting that's caused by infection um, from hop latent. So here's some more comparisons. Um, on your left, healthy stems, with, with shoots on the right infected. So really what we're seeing is a dwarfing. 
we're seeing a smaller version of the healthy plant. Um, here on the, on the left, similarly on the right, uh, slightly darker green leaves, but it's really dwarfed as a result of the infection. Here's the comparison of the flower development. And this is where it really starts to hurt economically is when you have a healthy inflorescence on the left and an infected one on the right. Basically, it's a reduced, a dwarfed production of flower, which again, if you didn't have this comparison, you may not have realized that this is infected by hop latent. Again, on the right, healthy, infected. It's just a reduced version, a smaller version of what you would see in a normal healthy plant. And so your yield is compromised here in some cases by as much as 40% because you're seeing this reduced growth and um, reduced flower development. Now, if you were to walk into a flower room, uh, there are ways that you can spot hop latent. One of the features that I've seen very commonly is that these flower uh, structures are slightly yellow. The bracts on the outside are slightly yellow. On the right is a strain that actually produces more pigment. The infected flower is much browner and has a deeper purp purple color. And we spot this and say that's probably as a result of the, the hop latent viroid. So you, you do see some of these, um, what we call very distinguishing symptoms on these flowers. So here you are, if you're walking through and you're looking down at your flowers, you notice this slight ring of yellow. The bracts here are slightly yellow. It's not a nitrogen deficiency. It's not iron or magnesium. It's the infection by the viroid that's causing this unusual um, yellowing around the, the, um, the base of the flower. In some strains, it's really dramatic. Um, it's almost, it's almost uh, pictureful. Um, I shouldn't say that, but it's almost a strain that you might look at and go, wow. That's pretty cool. Well, it's not that cool because it's severely infected by hop latent. And this is one of the symptoms that this particular strain develops, very, very distinct. You can see this from, from quite, a, quite a distance. So that's something I would suggest growers look for is any discoloration of the, um, the flowers themselves. When you finally get to, to, to harvest, um, again, what you see is on your left, the, the healthy inflorescences, these are dried. And on the right is the infected. Basically, it's just a shrunken version. Again, if you didn't have this comparison, if you didn't have a healthy plant, you might look at that and go, that's fine. You know, I got smaller flowers this year, maybe something in the environment. But in reality, it was infected with, with hop latent. And it's produced a much smaller flower head. Now, this is very distinct. On your left is the, the healthy plant or the healthy um, flower stem that's been cut and dried upside down. And again, you can make the side to side comparison. It's dwarfed, it's slightly darker green, and it's way smaller in terms of its yield as a result of the, the uh, viroid infecting the, the flowers and the, the plant in general. And I would say looking at that, it's almost a 30 to 40% reduction in um, development of this plant. So here are some numbers. Uh, we compared four strains shown here on the left. We looked at plant height, flower stem length, flower fresh weight, and THC. And as you can see, going down on the bottom, plant height was reduced 31%. The flower stem was reduced 33%. The flower fresh weight was reduced 27%. And here, the most significant reduction for growers is almost a 29% reduction in THC. Part of this is simply a, a reflection of the fact that you've got smaller flowers. They're just not producing as much THC. But as you'll see later, it's also a reflection of development of trichomes. There is a change in um, how the trichomes develop. So you're looking at about a 30% overall average in um, reduction of growth and THC. This is a really interesting uh, single plant that had produced a stem that was free of hop latent, as you see up here and produced a stem on the bottom that was infected with hop latent. So this was an ideal place to make comparisons of um, THC and terpenes. And what you see right away on the healthy stem, on the same plant, which was, which was free of the viroid, 27.8% THC. And on the, on the stem that was positive down here, 15.9. You're looking at about a 40% reduction in THC as a result 
Terpenes are down as well from 1.3% to 1.1, which is about a 10% reduction in terpenes. And so this tells you right off the bat that your yields in THC and terpenes are going down as a result of infection, even though um, it's on the same plant. We were, we were seeing uh, a healthy stem here and a disease stem down there. Now, how do you detect hop latent? Um, there are molecular methods out there. Many uh, companies are, are selling or, or providing services that are very accurate, very fast, that can help you detect whether or not you have hop latent viroid. It's based on um, RT-PCR, which is a, basically a reaction where you um, use primers, small sequences that bind to this sequence here, which is a sequence of hop latent, and you generate copies of this particular viroid. And uh, when you run a gel like we do, what you see are bands. Uh, these bands correspond to um, the presence of hop latent. Uh, we have multiple bands when we do this PCR reaction because we, we see um, the viroid itself is um, many cases forming these dimers where you have a head to tail, head to tail uh, configuration. And so when you put these primers on, you actually get multiple bands, a band from here and a band from there and so on. So when I show you these gels, I'll show you a bunch of these. When you see these bands, the presence of bands, whether it's a single band or a multiple band, it tells us that hop latent is present. So in this particular plant, it was present on the lower leaves, the middle leaves, the top leaves, and the roots. And so there are companies out there that will, will do this analysis for you and give you a result whether or not your plants are infected with hop latent or not. And that's something that's really important to do. So we've done this experiment and we've looked at a number of different plants. This just shows you the results of some of these plants that are all positive for hop latent. When we looked at the sequence of this viroid, we were surprised, uh, and maybe we shouldn't have been surprised, but basically it's homologous to, to the hop latent that's found uh, in Colorado, USA, on hemp, and also from hops in China, which means that there's a lot of um, viroid, of hop latent viroid that's conserved. In other words, very similar, regardless of uh, which host it's on and what area it's from. Okay, but it but it does tell us that this is this is what we see in our strains of of uh, cannabis. So what we wanted to do first of all is to see where would you sample a plant if you wanted to find hop latent. And this becomes complicated when you're dealing with mother plants because, as you see in this mother, uh, there are no symptoms. There's no flowers. There's no way to tell whether it's it's reduced in yield or not. And the industry standard ha for a long time has been take leaves from the bottom. Uh, three, three to five leaves with petioles and send those off for testing. So we wanted to see whether that was a good strategy or not. So we took a bunch of these mothers, we labeled them one, two, three, four, one being the top, two being the middle, three being the bottom, four being the roots. On this plant, one, two, three, four, the viroid was present everywhere. It was present throughout this plant, no symptoms, but as you can see from the bands, it's there. On another mother plant, when we sampled one, two, three, four, we found it in the top. We found it uh, here on the in the roots. And we also found it here, number two, on the side. We did not find it on the bottom. So had you taken your samples from position three, you would have concluded that this plant was healthy when in reality it's not because it still has hop latent. So sampling uh, becomes an issue. Where do you sample from? And so we did a study, uh, and this was in, in collaboration with Three Rivers Lab that did the analysis for us. What you see here in, in these seven or eight varieties or, or strains, where we took leaf samples, petiole samples, and root samples, that the root samples consistently gave us a positive reading, where in many cases, it's positive in the root, but negative in the leaf. And where it was negative in the leaf and the petiole, it was also negative in the roots. And so based on this study, we concluded that the roots sampling or roots are going to be probably a more sensitive way to analyze for hop latent than um, leaves, particularly leaves from the bottom of the plant. And after we um, did the study, we looked at roots from a number of different ways of growing cannabis, whether it's in uh, hydroponics, whether it's in peat uh, and soil, 
And uh, if you take multiple root samples from any of these root systems, if it is infected with hot latent, the chances are pretty good that you'll find it. It's probably present in the roots. And so after we did this study, uh, not very long afterwards, uh, Tumi Genomics also reported uh, a similar study where the data that they presented strongly suggest that upper root systems are ideal for sampling for hop latent. And they've conducted studies that show that this is indeed the case. Just about a week and a half ago, uh, Medicinal Genomics posted this on their website. Out of 40 plants that they tested, 15 were positive for hop latent, all of them in the roots, and only one, and only one plant was positive for the leaves. So had you sampled leaves out of this collection, one plant out of 40 would have shown positive, when in reality, there were 15 that were actually positive for hop latent, which means that roots are actually the way to go for um, sampling for this thyroid. Okay, so let's quickly talk about transmission. Uh, I think if you're a grower of cannabis, you'll know that this viroid uh, moves mechanically. Uh, it moves on pruning tools. It probably moves on your hands. It is definitely moving through cuttings. What we don't know is whether um, it moves through root contact. Does it move through water? Does it move through insects such as the root aphid? And does it move through seed? These were areas that we wanted to look at, which are highlighted here in blue, and compared to things that we know, which are highlighted here in yellow. In other words, how is this thing moving from one plant to another? So right about that time, there was a report uh, out of um, uh, Massachusetts from Dr. Dr. Nathan Johnson's lab that showed that hop latent viroid can be found in water. And this came as a real surprise to me because I'd never thought about water as being a way to move the viroid. And following that, Three Rivers reported that the cannabis root aphid can also cup hop latent viroid and it can be found in the aphid feeding on the roots. We don't know if it transmits it or not, but it certainly can pick it up. And so when you look at the literature on viruses, there are indeed many reports that show that viruses move through water, usually viruses that are sloughed off from the roots and spread through irrigation water, through hydroponic systems and so on. So it's, this is nothing new in terms of um, movement of pathogens, but it came as a surprise to me that um, this particular viroid is present uh, and moving in water. So here's some uh, examples of potato spindle tuber viroid, pepino mosaic, potato virus Y, where studies have shown if you have an infected plant, you have a healthy plant. These are not in contact. They're in separate containers, but they're shared the same water or hydroponic solution. You can pick up the virus on another plant from the infected plant. And similarly here with potato. And so the idea is that if you have two cannabis plants growing next to one another, not touching, but sharing the same water, they could potentially get infected. So we set that up. We set up an experiment where we took an infected, hop latent infected plant, put it in a cloner next to a healthy plant. You can see here the root systems, way smaller in the infected plant, healthy in the, um, or bigger in the healthy. They're not touching, but they share the same water. And within two weeks, within two weeks, we saw in cases where we had infection here in the positive control and no infection in the negative, after two weeks, we were seeing these bands showing up in plants that were previously healthy. So what that suggested is that indeed, something was moving in this hydroponic solution from one plant to another. Most likely it's uh, root cells that have sloughed off. Plants do slough off root cells or root uh, tissues that have broken off, pieces of root, root cap, et cetera, et cetera. These are very small. They can be carried in water. And it's most likely that's where the viroid is moving. The viroid will not be found on its own in the absence of a host. It's replicating in the cells, it's in the nucleus, and it doesn't get free uh, as a viroid. It has to be moved with these plant cells, which is very, very likely the way in which it's moving in hydroponic solutions. So we did an experiment where we took a couple of infected plants over here, we placed them a distance away from a healthy plant, and we flooded this tray twice a day. So the water was flowing in between these two plants. 
And when we looked at the plants on the other side, they were previously healthy. We saw about a 20% transmission rate. So what that's saying is that plants that are infected with hop latent, if they're adjacent to other plants and the water is moving between them in a hydroponic system, you could potentially get up to a 20% transmission, which can be pretty significant over the, over the long term. And so the idea is that most likely root cells are being sloughed off and are moving with the water and landing on a healthy root system. And somehow the viroid is finding its way through. We don't know exactly how plants pick up the viroid from the roots. We know they can pick it up from leaves and stems. So this requires some more work in terms of how is it the root system, an exposed root system picking up this viroid and whether or not this occurs in soil, which I doubt very much also needs to be determined. So the best way to transmit hop latent is through mechanical wounding and on the stem. So this is a technique we've developed where we take a plant, we cut off uh, the top part, which is where you would normally remove a cutting, take some sap and just sort of dab it onto that cut surface and wait. So this is where the original cut was made. And as you see here from these arrows, from the point of infection, which is uh, shown here, the first place that we found the viroid was actually in the roots. We infected it here, the first place, number six. If you look at the lane over here, number six is infected. And then within two weeks, we found it up here, number one. So if you look at the gel, number one has a positive and number six has a positive. And this was then followed by number five down here. So when we infect up here, it first goes down to the roots. It then goes up to the leaves and then it spreads. Okay, so this is important because we'll talk about the significance of spread and how long it takes. So we repeated this experiment again. This time we used a lot of different clones. Before inoculation, you can see they were all free of hop latent. After we inoculated them using that um, stem inoculation, within four weeks, you can see pretty much all of them have picked up the viroid. We find it first in the roots, which is labeled R. And then later on, we find it in the leaves. So this is at four weeks. We're seeing a few plants here that don't have it in the leaves. If you look at the same plants two weeks later, this is now week six, every plant has picked up hop latent viroid. So once again, when we inoculate at the tip where you take your cutting, the viroid first moves down to number one, it then moves up to number two, and then it spreads laterally to number three and number four and so on. So this is why sampling the roots is so important. It's because that's apparently where the viroid ends up first. And then uh, sampling young leaves is probably another good point for collecting this viroid. Lower leaves or older leaves, as you, as you saw in previous studies, is probably not the ideal place for finding hop latent. And here's an example of what happens after we inoculate. You can see the classic symptoms develop on this plant, which is infected. And on the right is a healthy plant growing side by side. So what's going on? When you inoculate a leaf or a stem, as you see up here, the viroid first moves down into the roots, as you see with the arrows, and then it moves up to the top of the plant, as you see here in the young leaves. And the reason this is happening is because the viroid is moving through the phloem. And the phloem is that, that system, transport system, where um, stored nutrients and energy reserves in the roots are being sent up to the top of the plant where it's needed the most. The leaves, the flowers all need energy. And so initially it goes down to the roots. It must most likely replicates here and then is, is shunted up to the top of the plant. So what you see here is coming in from the leaf cells, it enters the phloem. When it gets up to the leaf cells, it exits from the phloem. And um, there are these structures in plants, in plant cells that are called plasma desmata. The plasma desmata actually allow this viroid to move from cell to cell, just like a virus. It moves very similarly to a virus. So here's the experiment we did. When we inoculated, you can see the roots are infected and it moves up through the phloem. And these tissues up here, these rapidly growing leaves, these flowers, are acting what we call sinks. 
the sink is the part of the plant that needs the most energy. And it takes the energy from any stored reserves in the roots. And so the movement of energy, for example, sugar, up the plant is moving the viroid along with it as a result of the flow of energy or nutrients up the plant. Now, for a root infection to occur, the viroid has to enter the root system, find its way into the phloem, and then work its way up. And this is why I think the transmission rate in roots is lower, 20%, because I think it's difficult for the, for the viroid to make its way into the root system, but we don't know that. What we do know is if you inoculate the leaf and the stem, it's going to move the viroid very rapidly through the phloem. The other thing that's really intriguing is that when you take these plants and you flip them in a 12, 12 hour cycle as you would during flowering, the hop latent viroid concentration is way lower in plants that are grown under continuous light or 18 hours or 24 hours. The minute you flip them as you would in cannabis production, the concentration of the viroid and its movement is dramatically increased. It's, it's almost ironic that we're trying to flower this plant and if it's got hop latent in it, it's gonna make things way worse than it was had you not turned the lights down. And again, we don't know why other than there may be obviously nutrients uh, and sucrose and other things needed for flower production. And by flipping the lights and making the plants go into flower, it's moving that phloem material up into the flowers as well as hop latent. That's the theory that we're, we're currently working on. The downside of course, is when everything moves up into the flower, the frequency of hop latent infect infected flowers is very high. Not only does the, does the plant move the viroid in the phloem, it actually moves it into the flower. This is a study we did where we randomly took eight samples of flowers that were ready to be sent for sale. And out of the eight samples, five had hop latent. In other words, flower tissues or flower buds that were being sold or were intended for sale, in many cases, have hop latent viroid in them, which suggests that the levels of THC are going to be lower than what potentially you would expect. This may be a concern. We need to look at this a little bit more. But the reason that the flowers are infected is because it's an ideal place for the photosynthates and sucrose to end up in the flower. So much so that um, because we knew it was in the, in the female flowers, we wanted to know what about male flowers? If you had a plant, a male plant that was flowering and was infected with hop latent, would you find the viroid in the flowers? And the answer is yes. You find it as you see here in the, on this gel, F stands for flower, A stands for anther, R stands for root, and L stands for leaf. As you can see in plant number two, the anthers have taken up quite a bit of the viroid, probably as a result of the fact they need a lot of energy to develop. They're taking up the photosynthate and the viroid moves right through into the, um, into the anthers. So now I've told you that the viroid is found in flowers, in the female flowers, and I've told you that the viroid is found in male flowers. And so the obvious question that is gonna come up, is it found in the seed? Um, if it's found in the female flower, and if it's found in the male flower, the answer is yes. It's going to be found in the seed. And I'll show you some data in just a second. What we don't know is whether or not it occurs in the pollen. These are pollen from male flowers. We know it's in the anther. This is the anther right here, this large tissue. Most likely it is getting through the pollen because otherwise it, it wouldn't be able to transmit. But we don't have the data yet, but I think there's data out there that shows this. So we collaborated with, with um, Tumi Genomics and Tumi Genomics did, did this following study. The next three slides that I'm going to show you were courtesy of them. And they took infected female plants and they crossed them with healthy male plants. And they took healthy female plants and they crossed them with infected male plants. So in other words, they had combinations of, is the viroid coming from the female or is the viroid coming from the male? In both cases, what they found was that the seed that came out of, out of these plants had hop latent viroid, regardless of whether the male was healthy or the female was healthy. If any one partner 
had the viroid, it was going to spread. And here's the data that they, they um, shared with me. These are three female plants. You can see the proportion of hop latent. These are three male plants. This is the frequency of, of hop latent. This is data from seed. So you can see overall when the seed, when, when the female plant is infected, the proportion of seed infected is higher than when the male plant is infected, shown in the blue. But regardless, whether it's an infected female or an infected male, both of them apparently will give rise to infected seed. What is important here though, is the level of viroid that's present. If the female plants are heavily infected, the proportion of seed that's infected goes up. If the plants have less viroid in them, then the proportion of seed is, is less. Okay, so the reason why we see female one, female two, and female three are different, it's because they differ in how much viroid they had to begin with. But regardless, this is the bad news. And I'm glad that I, I don't get to share this with you from a study that I did, but it's a study from another lab. Um, but it is bad news. And that is when you plant those seeds that are infected, the frequency of seedlings that are infected could be as high as 43%. The range is from 23 to 53, depending on the mother. If the mother is heavily infected, you get a higher frequency. If the mother is less infected, you get a lower frequency. But we're looking at anywhere from 20 to 40% seed infection, both on the outside of the seed and in the seed, because clearly these are seedlings that were grown from the embryo and they were infected. So that puts to rest the idea that um, hop latent viroid is not seed, in, seed infect, infecting, it is. Okay, the last thing I'll talk about um, for maybe 10 minutes or so is um, survival. How long does it survive in sap? How long does it survive in leaves? Does it survive at high temperatures? Can it survive treatment with UVC and so on and so forth? So we went ahead and tried to explore all, all of these various things. We did some experiments where we artificially took some infected plants, ground them up, put some sap onto these gloves, let the gloves sit for 30 minutes, one hour, three hours, five hours, 24 hours, one day, three days, five days. We then took the sap, scraped it off the gloves, ran a gel, and lo and behold, anywhere from 30 minutes to five days, the viroid was stable as seen in these gels. So it can survive a minimum of five days as dried sap on gloves or on the surface of a table without having its stability affected. Now, we're looking at stability, which means is the viroid being degraded or broken down? We don't know yet about transmission. If you took dried sap and put it on a plant, would it infect? I think it would because it's stable, it's alive, but we haven't done that experiment. But what it tells you is it survives for a long time. What about in dried leaves? We took leaves and dried them. Seven days, 14 days, 21 days, 28 days. Ran a gel, lo and behold, it's there. So dried leaves on the floor, dried leaves, wherever they are, still have hop latent viroid in them after a month. And most likely they are infective, but we don't know that. But we know it's stable, it's there. What else can we treat? Uh, we decided to treat with temperature up to 70 degrees. Uh, we thought we would expose the tissues to UVC radiation, as well as various treatments. So to do that, we took infected roots, very, very fine root fragments, which had hop latent in them. You can't do these experiments with sap because it, it's extremely hard technically to do that. So we took these fine roots and exposed them to these various treatments. And we asked, is the viroid there or not? First, we did temperature all the way from 30 degrees to up to 80 degrees for 15 minutes and 30 minutes. And what you see is the viroid band is still stable. You'll notice as you get really hot up about 70, 80 degrees, it looks like the concentration is going down. And I say that because the intensity of the band is less. But even when you heat tissues, up to 80 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes, the viroid is stable and presumably can still infect. 
what about UVC? We took UVC lamps and we took leaves and we took roots and we exposed them to three minutes, five minutes. And lo and behold, the viroid is still stable. Even after five minutes of treatment with UVC, which if I was to put my hand out, would have burnt my hand severely. Uh, it didn't do much for the viroid other than we think there may be a reduction in, in the numbers, but it's still there. And last but not least, this experiment where we took root fragments, very small root fragments, and exposed them to various chemicals such as vircon, xerotol, bleach, hypochlorous acid, and um, exposed the tissue for two minutes to these treatments and looked to see for stability of the viroid. And as you can see from this very beautiful gel, every single treatment had no effect on the stability of the viroid. Now, I need to clarify this because I don't want people walking away thinking Vircon, Xerotol, bleach doesn't work. It works, I'm sure, very well on tools, on surface sterilization, on your hands. But if you have tissues, small tissues like roots that may have the viroid in it, these treatments don't seem to affect it because it, it's quite stable within, within the plant tissues itself. We haven't done the next experiment, which is going to happen soon in taking actual sap, exposed sap, and treating it with these various chemicals. Um, it's a hard experiment to do because um, we can't transmit the virus and show symptoms easily. So we have to think of a way that um, we can demonstrate these chemicals are working. But on fine pieces of root, you can see this viroid is super stable. Okay, I'm gonna um, quickly end here and show you some, some pretty pictures. Um, pictures that actually demonstrate why the THC is actually going down or is lower as a result of hop latent infection. So what we did here is we used a scanning microscopy and scanning microscopy is really, as you can see from these images, a very, very vivid way or a very uh, cool way to actually study trichomes. And what you see here are healthy trichomes, trichomes that come uh, from plants that are not infected with hop latent. They develop normally, they've got these huge bulbs on them, very nice stalks. And this is where cannabinoids and terpenes and so on are being produced, of course. So what we wanted to do was compare a hop latent infected flower bud to one that was not infected. So on your left is the healthy uh, bract from a flower that does not have hop latent. On the right is a flower bud that has hop latent. You notice right away, there's very few long stalks. The trichomes that are here are very small. They haven't fully developed when you make the side-by-side -side comparison. Here's another shot on your left. The trichomes are fully developed, long stalks, big heads. On the right, hop latent infected. The trichomes are still there. The numbers are there, but the size is not. They're smaller. They're stunted. They don't, do, they don't look good. They haven't developed well at all. And when you do a schematic to show you a healthy bract, which has these large trichomes, an infected bract, which has these small trichomes, you can capture that using these um, computer enhanced images where you notice the larger um, glandular heads here in the healthy leaf and the smaller heads here in the infected leaf, or the, I should say bract, but notice the numbers are not different. You can see the same numbers of trichomes. So it's not that the numbers are going down. The development stage is reduced. They're not as mature. They don't seem to have the energy to, to complete their cycle and move to a, a fully developed trichome. This is again a computer enhanced image. Uh, on your left are diseased bracts. They have trichomes on them, but they're much smaller. On the right, you see the larger glands shown with the larger bulbs here. And uh, this is why we think the THC is much lower is you've got smaller, smaller trichome glands, smaller heads that aren't producing as much THC. And so this is just data to confirm that. If you look at trichome numbers, no different, symptomatic, asymptomatic. If you look at trichome stalk length, the length is very much reduced. If you look at the trichome head diameter, very, very much reduced. 
And if you look at THC, it's very much reduced. And so these trichomes are not producing as much of the um, cannabinoids that we'd like because they either don't have the energy or they're infected and that's causing them to reduce their, their production. So here's the most dramatic comparison. These are um, trichomes on dried flowers. And you notice on the left, the trichome glands are intact. This is a healthy flower. And on your right is from a diseased flower. And you notice the trichome heads are shrunken. They're not fully developed. And down here, you can see they've collapsed. And so if you think about a hot air balloon that's being filled up with cannabinoids, on the healthy plant, it's gonna completely fill up and be full. On a diseased plant that has hop latent, those, that hot air balloon is half filled. And as a result, it collapses, as you see here. And that's the reason why we think, one of the reasons why we think we're seeing this reduction in terpenes and cannabinoids is that these heads are just not being filled with cannabinoids. So here it is. This is sort of a summary of why we're seeing reduced cannabinoids and why it's impacting growers. Is your, you see this lower dollar sign. These are what hop latent infected trichomes look like. This is what a healthy uh, mature trichome should look like. And you can see that there's a vast difference in, in the development. And um, it could be a number of things. It could be that genes have been turned off. It could be the, the pathways are turned off. We don't know yet. All we know is that um, these plants are not producing as much um, cannabinoids. So finally, um, as a summary, um, this is information taken from potato spindle tuber viroid. In terms of management options, um, they list obviously uh, quite, a, quite a few. Um, certified disease-free plants is really uh, highly recommended. In other words, plants that have been tested that are clean, that are free of viroid, uh, is really the only way to start a, a propagation system. Is if you've got to be able to do that. Um, if you're bringing in plant materials uh, from outside, they should be tested. They should definitely be tested by PCR. And if they're infected, they should be thrown out. Uh, pruning tools, uh, handling of plants should be done carefully. The viroid is heat stable, as you saw, heated up to 80 degrees, makes no difference. But sanitation, disinfectants, are recommended. Things like bleach and vircon are recommended on surfaces, on gloves, on tools. Despite the fact they may not inactivate or kill the viroid, it's still a good idea to have that used to prevent transmission from one plant to the next. Here's um, the only, I, I would say the only good news slide if you, if you want to look at it that way. And that is that there are significant differences between cannabis strains in their susceptibility to hop latent. There are some strains as you see here with the arrow that are highly sensitive. And there are other strains down here with this arrow that are quite resistant or quite tolerant. And so growers need to be aware that um, by looking at the different strains you're growing, you are going to find some that have more tolerance to hop latent. We don't know why, but they are resilient to hop latent. And those are the ones that need to be grown. And you need to throw out the really sensitive ones, as you see here. So out of a group of 25, there's at least five or six that are quite tolerant. They're not free of disease, but they're tolerant. That's a bit of a good news because um, you can select through breeding over the long term strains that may have resistance to hop latent without knowing the mechanism yet. This is an example of how hop latent spreads. In a greenhouse, these little black dots are showing you infected plants. You can see in certain strains, the incidence of hop latent is quite high. In others, it's much less, as you see here with, with a few black dots. We don't know if this is plant-to-plant -plant transmission. We haven't quite determined that. It could just be a whole bunch of infected cuttings that were brought in, but it does show a big difference between this strain and this. I wanna just conclude here in about three minutes to talk about tissue culture, because that comes up all the time. Can tissue culture eliminate hop latent? And my answer is, it depends. Is it derived from a meristem or is it a nodal segment that was propagated? Was it tested while it was in tissue culture to show the viroid was not there? Was it tested again after it came out of tissue culture? Because if you don't test again, 
the viroid may be there, not replicating, but still present. And when you grow these plants out, they will show positives. We know that heat therapy doesn't work. The viroid is very heat stable. What about cold therapy? It's been seen in the literature that maybe cold therapy works. We don't know that yet. I haven't seen any data to show that that will actually work in conjunction with, with hot latent. So right now I would say, if you are going to be using tissue culture plants, the first thing to, to inquire is whether they came from meristems. These are meristems here. These are nodal segments. Notice the difference in size. These theoretically will not have hop latent. These probably will. And so when you propagate from meristems, you should come up with plants, if they're tested, to be free of hop latent. If you propagate from nodal segments, if the wire was present, it'll continue being propagated all the way across. So one needs to consider how the tissue cultures were derived, as well as were these plants really tested carefully um, before, they were, before they were released to make sure that you don't have uh, the viroid present. The last thing, uh, two more slides, is eradication. If you are going to remove hop latent viroid from your facility, you have to implement a very intense eradicative program. And what I mean by that is any infected plant that's detected must be thrown out. So for example, if you, if you follow this scheme right here, where you start with about 1700 plants and you find a bunch that are infected, you throw them out, you find a bunch more, you throw them out. If you continue down this cycle right here, all the way to the end, you will end up with fewer plants but theoretically, you will end up with plants that are free of hop latent. It has to be enforced, it has to be tested, and it has to be strictly, strictly monitored. I'll give you an example of one licensed facility where we looked at eradicative program. And what these individuals did was they sampled and they tested, and they sampled and they tested. And that's what the blue line is. The orange line is the frequency of infection after six or 12 months. The good news is that the line is trending down, as you see, from 20% down to almost 1%. But there are going to be problems along the way. When you think you've got it solved, you bring in a bunch of plants that have hop latent, it rises up again, you clean everything out, it goes down, something else goes wrong, it goes up, you clean it up, it goes down, and so on and so on. It's not an easy battle but it has to be done. You have to throw these plants away, you have to test them, and you keep only the ones that are free of hop latent. And over time, you will end up with fewer infected plants overall. I'm gonna stop there. And I know there's time for questions. I see uh, 14 in chat. And so I'm going to make sure that we um, have time for for um, questions in uh, in the in the in the panel here, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Zamir. Uh, really uh, completed uh, talk, and uh, as usual, uh, as I was expecting, it's the uh, essence of doing the overall picture around disease management, including everything, and you did everything, and look at all the elements. Um, for time management, there's a few questions. Most of them are. Uh, on the uh, infection percentage-wise or disinfection, uh, curing the disease with disinfectant. Uh, so let me start with the percentage of infection. Uh, of infe uh, infection. Um, was it possible from the sample ID from the labs, uh, from the information that you received, to make the discrimination if these samples were from asymptomatic plants or from symptomatic plants? Because the percentage will be, uh, of course, really, uh, really different. Right? Right. Yeah, that's a good question because um, when these samples are submitted, so for example, to a and labs, um, presumably the growers picked them because they felt something was wrong. And so they may have been symptomatic, but uh, a lot of times when we run tests as well, we also, we also submit asymptomatic samples and many of them still come back positive. So um, for sure, if it's symptomatic, I shouldn't say for sure, there are these really odd things that go on in cannabis plants sometimes that we look at and go, oh, it's a virus. Oh, it's this, it's that. We don't know for sure. Um, but if it is got the curl leaf and it's stunted, um, it's probably hop latent virus. It should be tested. If it's not symptomatic and you're still concerned, it's a plant you brought in from another grower, I would say send it off for testing anyway. 
just to be sure. Now, to me, it would be really interested linking to uh, another question as well. Uh, when we look at the survival being much longer within plant tissue, uh, and we look at how many flowers are stored in the market right now, which are also uh, stored at cooler temperatures where the survival may be even, even longer. Uh, if we would go out there and uh, sample a lot of flowers from a lot of sources for both VOID and THC content, linking to the uh, label that sometimes go overboard on THC, uh, we would have a lot of generation in there, but it's a risk for the spread as well because these flowers are touched by different individuals that may go back and work in the plants. Uh, yeah, so it, it, it's definitely possible. We're, we're running the experiment now where we're taking a dried flower bud, we're grinding it up and taking that, that material and putting it on a plant to make sure that it can infect. It, it probably is going to infect. Um, one thing I'm gonna throw out there, and this came up from a previous discussion I had uh, with, with the cannabis magazine. There is absolutely no evidence anywhere that viroids are uh, detrimental or can affect humans. There's absolutely no evidence anywhere of any viroid disease that's ever been discovered in humans. So, uh, you know, when we think about hop latent being in certain buds or things that you may want to use for recreational purposes or whatever, um, there's no evidence at all. Uh, there's no viroids at all anywhere on this planet that are known to infect animals or humans just because of the nature of their infection mechanisms and so on. They are only found in plants. Yeah. yeah. Um, other question that we have, uh, a lot of them are obviously on disinfection or how can we kill it? Uh, you talked uh, and then showed us a good result as well. Um, on my side, I'm a bit curious on the UVC being all about contact line, if there's a biofilm or anything in front of the UVC lamp in water treatment, if you can see those down. Uh, you tested roots, the roots are more protected if the railing is deep inside. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the power of UVC disinfection in the water itself, where the particles of plant may be smaller? Yes, in, in fact, uh, water treatment is certainly something that needs to be looked at, whether it's through UVC or ozone or hypochlorous acid, whatever. Um, in the roots, in the water, it's most likely more, more susceptible because, you know, I showed the little root cells that are, that are being broken off, little pieces of organic matter that may contain the viroid, more sensitive than the roots that I used and the leaves that I used. Um, I don't know for sure whether UVC uh, will work, it, it should, it inactivates most viruses and, and, and other exposed organisms. So if it, if it is found in very small root cells, I would say yes, uh, UVC, as well as these other treatments. Um, because technically it's hard to demonstrate in a large volume of water that's treated with UVC, how much viroid you still have intact. Um, all the disinfection mechanisms or techniques that are used now, I would encourage growers to keep doing them. What we looked at was stability, not necessarily infectivity. We know it's stable, we know it survives. I mean, COVID survives in, in water, you know, in the streams and in, in, in various places, but it doesn't mean that it's infective. So yeah. keep doing the UVC if you're doing it, keep doing the, the um, Vercon or, or bleach or, or whatever treatments because it's likely going to reduce transmission. It may not kill it, but it's preventing spread. If we link this up to uh, another question as well on um, disinfection, uh, different products, uh, there's been a lot of work with viruses and the tomato brown ribose fruit virus is an example of this that can last months on computer mouses and door handles. Now, VOA don't last as long on surfaces, but if we take an example of the potato uh, spindle, uh, the VOA, uh, the disinfection of bleach, uh, you need 10%. Anything lower, uh, many uh, papers are, are showing lack of efficacy. Now, bleach is corrosive for tools. Uh, there's some papers from uh, Lee and all and Mackey in 2015 with uh, milk and bleach being the, the best and Vercon sadly not doing enough. Uh, we need to test more. You are already uh, testing a few products. Uh, Vineland Research Station may be involved as well. Uh, this is an example for all the audience that uh, the research needs to be done. The more we can collaborate together, the more we can uh, do things and know things. Right? I totally agree. Um, I, I, and I think yeah. it, it goes back to the, the most fundamental question, and that is make sure your plants are clean. 
if you can prevent the viroid from spreading or getting into your plant material, then you've, you've eliminated the, the need for these other um, things, which are not necessarily 100% effective. I'll, I'll just throw out one more statistic. When Tumi Genomics was doing their study on seed transmission, uh, they were looking to see whether it's on the seed coat or whether it's inside the seed. They had to sterilize the seeds in 20% bleach for 20 minutes to remove the viroid from the seed coat. 20% for 20 minutes, which really basically kills the seed. Um, but they had to do it to prove that it's not on the outside, but it's actually on the inside. That's how stable this viroid is. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous how stable it is uh, because yeah. of this, this double-stranded rod um, structure that it forms. Yeah. Um, another question was one of my questions as well, and a question from one of the audience is, when we look at literature and the uh, different variants, uh, the CAN1 and the CAN2 uh, of the update and velvet that we've seen in cannabis that were ID. Um, there's a strong relation between cultivars and variants with symptomatic or, or asymptomatic plants. Uh, what are your thoughts on this in terms of in the cultivar that you've seen that you tested the variants? Was it one more than two uh, or what the literature is saying on this? Yeah, so I mean, you know, I would say right now there's about five or 10% of the, the varieties or strains that probably have a good uh, level of tolerance or resistance to hop latent. We don't see the resistance in the roots. And it's important because when we were sampling the roots, we found it, but yet it, the ability for it to spread to the rest of the plant was minimized in these other, in these specific varieties. So in other words, you know, we would sample leaves from these plants waiting for the viroid to move up and it, it just wasn't there, but we found it you know, present in the roots. So if you're testing roots for resistance, you won't, you won't get good results. I think the, the, the resistance testing has to be done from the ground up. Now, what is going on? What is the mechanism? Is it, is it reduced spread? Is it the viral gets up there but can't replicate? Uh, we, we still don't know that. The only good news is that there is something there for breeders to work on, that they can, yeah. if they can get their hands on it, we'll obviously have to develop a screening method. How do we conclusively show that these, uh, these varieties or strains are indeed resistant. I mean, that's just a matter of time. Um, one idea I had is, is when, you, when you cut that light, when you bring it into a 12-12 photo period, that really seems to trigger the onset of hop latent. That might be a good screening tool. You take your plants, you stick them at 12-12 and see if they develop symptoms. And if they don't, then you've got a, you've got a winner. You've got a winner. So th there may be some screening methods that can be developed from these ideas might also be different between day and night because the plants do transpiration and present is in different time. Right? Exactly. exactly. Uh, there's a lot of things there. Exactly. <laughs> um, we have a few minutes uh, quickly, so I'll try to squeeze two more questions in from the audience. Uh, I think we've covered 80% of them so far. Uh, if you have more questions that were not answered, we will make sure to follow up by emails with you guys, uh, either Sarah and I. Uh, we, we can uh, link this up in the uh, next emails with everybody. Uh, one question uh, is just on genetic resistance. Is it possible for the plants to be ever genetically resistant to the oil? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, you know, we don't really know how this viroid originated. So, for example, should we be testing land races? Should we be testing some of the original uh, varieties that are out there from Afghanistan and China and other places like that? Or is this something that's been around for, for a super long period of time? We don't know that. But the fact that we are seeing these, these visual differences in, in sensitivities suggests that there is a genetic basis for, for the resistance. Um, it, it may not be like a virus resistance where you get a hypersensitive response and the plant defends itself. It may be more a movement thing. It may be more um, the, abil the ability for, of the plant to outgrow the viroid. You know, it's, it just stays one step ahead and, and still is able to yield. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think that's where a lot of the work really needs to happen because as you know, even with tomato brown rugos mosaic virus, the real answer is going to be resistance, right? You go back and look at the, your germplasm and see, uh, can we identify some cannabis strains that are more tolerant? Um, and, and that's going to be the way to go. Yeah. Um, I'm linking to maybe the last questions, going back to the experiments uh, with the fusarium, with the uh, infested or non-infested with plants. 
Um, the question is that early, uh, what is your impression of what the results could be if you would flip the inspection uh, order? If you have the Fusion first, if you have the deal with first, they're both interacting in the movement in the flow M, obviously. Uh, when the Fusion is there first, it may block it faster if it's in the pit. That is the essence of the question here from the uh, yeah, so I mean, the, so what the viroid is doing, uh, and I, I had a slide towards the end of my talk that was really complicated because it's got all these pathways. It's basically debilitating the plant. It's taking a lot of energy out of it for its own replication. It's also shutting down a bunch of genes. It's just turning them off. It's called gene silencing. Um, and all of these, when you put them all together, in hops, I think they found as many of, as, many as 5,000 genes were affected by hop latent. We don't know how many genes are affected in cannabis, but I would think it's at least 5,000. So when you got 5,000 genes being affected, something's gonna go wrong. And what we saw was going wrong was fusarium. The plants were, were more sensitive to fusarium. Um, we've also seen, by the way, um, more susceptibility to powdery mildew. And that came as a big surprise because powdery mildew is an obligate parasite, but it still needs nutrients from the host to survive. And if you, if you change that, it could change the, the, the order. Now, if you put fusarium first um, and then try to do hop latent, uh, I don't know that there would be much of a difference. Uh, the fusarium most likely will kill the plant or, or make it very weak. Hop latent does not like weak plants. From our experiments, we found the healthier your plant, the more vigorous it is, the more likely it's going to spread hop latent. When you've got a, a plant that's, that's debilitated for nutrients or has a pythium infection, it doesn't get hop latent as much because the hop latent really wants to survive in a, in a healthy plant. And so uh, ironically, again, uh, plants that are really vigorous, that are exploding, uh, if I can use that word, are going to be moving that viroid more extensively than a plant that maybe has fusarium. Oh, it, it does make sense with the triangles and uh, the principles of the gene deep yeah. All right, so it is 1.30. Sarah is back on track to probably uh, keep the time up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I'm trying not to bring the giant cane out. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Sebastian, first of all, for hooking us up with this incredible speaker. Uh, Dr. Zamir Punja, thank you so much for such a clear and thorough talk uh, for both scientists and growers. I think it was a, a struck a really good balance and we really appreciate that here on Grow On. And I just wanna let the audience members know um, that you can watch a recording of this webinar immediately through Zoom with your registration link, but we'll also um, clean it up a bit with editing <laughs> and uh, put it on the On Floriculture YouTube channel, as well as the On Floriculture blog. You can find it under the recording recorded webinars tab. Um, so just give us a few days for that. And I've put the links in the chat if you're unfamiliar with those. Um, and the last thing I just wanna mention is um, we've got a quick survey at the end. It's just three questions, but it helps us know whether this content was relevant to you and whether you see, wanna see more of this kind of content from us. And with that, thank you again, Sebastian and Dr. Punja and everyone in the audience for attending and giving us really engaging questions. And everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again to both thank of you, you for organizing. For yep, thank you. Bye everyone.